everybody. Nice Welcome. Tone. <laughs> Thanks, nice brother. Tone. You got a nice tone, though. Oh, I'm trying to yeah. keep the licorice live right oh, here. Man, that's a nice tone. <laughs> well, it's a lot of practice, a lot of years to get that that mellow tone. In a mellow tone, as Duke Ellington would say. Yes. Well, folks, I want to welcome first my favorite number one guest of all time, Tommy Chong, to a rebel without applause right here in my little television studio apartment in the wood of the holly. We're going to break it down. Not only one of my favorite people as just an individual, but he has crossed so many boundaries in this world from show business and beyond as one of the great comedians he is an actor director he is a musician he is a prophet and a social avatar of multiculturalism and i'm always totally stoked when he's in my little digital domain welcome tommy chong how are you well thank you bill for having me in your little next to thailand uh (laughs) thai world apartment (laughs) (laughs) well you know when i think about your life on so many levels the last thing is is really this sort of you're at the point of the spear of multiculturalism not only in your own self but in your comedy and in just so many so many areas and i feel like you've been like way ahead of the curve in terms of understanding the value and the beauty of that in our society so it's just a way to kick this off i I just wanted you to comment on that because it feels so powerful to me. yeah well you know I've, I've been blessed and uh super blessed when i'm on podcasts and that you know i i usually go uh, what i call a god rant you know i go off on a god rant i kind of get a perverse thrill out of listening watching the host get uncomfortable <laughs> 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 you, know, you know especially uh, the, the not you but the 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 other people that aren't aren't quite there yet, you know, right? And so, is it hip to to acknowledge, you know, the spiritual uh, power that drives everything? Uh, yeah, I've been having fun with it. Like I'm a writer. You're you're a writer too. Mm-hmm. You go to a dinner party, and if you're unlucky enough to sit beside a writer, the last thing you want to say to him is, "So what? You, what have you been up to lately?" <laughs> yeah. You might be there for a few days. <laughs> well, I have a one-line answer. So when people say, what are you working on? I go, my next disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my go-to line, you know. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that, who, who's that? Who's that? Sound like, yeah. That's funny. That's, <laughs> that's funny. Well, you know, this anti-Semitic uh, rant, you know, when... Uh, uh, Conway and and uh, and that you know Kyrie, they're not quite there yet. You know they're 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 noticing things, but see see the problem was with, with with people is they get defensive because to them everything is a win or lose situation. Or am I right and you're wrong? Or I used to think this way and now I think that way. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you pay attention to just the basic Ten Commandments, say, that Moses brought. So many of our religious or spiritual leaders, you know, they all got the one thing in common, and that's they got a little glint in their eye, and they got a cosmic giggle, I call it. Mm. Because what they've learned, and this is what I'm learning too, is that our purpose here on Earth is so simple. It is so simple that you kind of, when you find out, you kind of shake your head because when you're younger, just in order to stay on the planet, you you got to be always striving to grow. If you do learn the secrets too soon, well, there's no such thing as too anything, too soon, too late. No, everything happens when it's supposed to happen at the time it's supposed to happen. That's just the way, it, that's the way this physical world is. And so what I learned is that the more you learn, the less you want to talk about it, and the more you can just sit there and smile and, and kind of nod, because what you're learning is that we're in this endless cycle of birth and rebirth, you know, and it's never going to end. The best you can do is to help one another 
help each other, but you don't want to get in anybody's way of learning. See, right, so right. It, so when you learn the Ten Commandments, one of the most important commandment is judge not. To me, that's one of the most important. What I what I've been doing lately with my life is is going through those commandments one at a time, because there's so much meaning in those commandments. Because what what commandments are? This is what I found out. Well, this is what I found out about golf, for instance. You know what makes golf so fabulous, Bill? You tell me, because I haven't. I don't. I surf. The rules. Interesting. The rules. If you never had the rules that we got, golf would not be as popular as it is, because what we got with golf is an activity that can never be conquered. It can only be enjoyed, you know? If you hit a perfect score, there's little to, to rejoice about because it's perfect. So you got nothing to talk about. No one wants to hear you anyway, you know? Shit, I shot a, I shot a 63, you know? Who gives a shit, you know? And no one's ever done that. And, and you did it, so what? So what I, I learned with golf, it's the rules, you see? If you break those rules, then you've broke your word, you know, because golf really is a gentleman's game where you, your word is what people will accept, right. you know. And that's why, like, Trump, he, he's, he's lousy at golf because he cheats. He cheats. Yeah. And so when you cheat, you, you got nothing. Yeah, there's no more game. There's no more thing. Just like, like what, you're, what they're trying to do with the election. Just elect me and don't don't make me lose i don't want i don't like to lose because it doesn't feel good people don't want to talk to me uh so i just say i won but i don't want to play the game i don't want to put it to the test you know and so 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 golf to trump is like it's like just a meaningless exercise that goes nowhere you know what always struck me is that every sunday we root for our teams in football and sometimes they're bad calls and sometimes you know the guy screws up or even the referee makes a mistake but if you lose it hurts and you go on you we accept results every week in football every day in basketball oh my god the referee it, but they lost and yeah. somehow in this instance at this moment they just can't accept what we're just used to accepting every day, which is defeat. It's a spoiled kid. It's a, it's a spoiled kid. You know, put on the shoes. It's cold outside. I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not going to do it. You can't make me. Yeah, we're trapped in this insane pathology of this guy, and yeah. we have yet to escape it. And I mean, but Bill, Bill, you know what the good news is? Tell me. The good news is the way Trump's going. There won't be a Republican Party left. No. Eventually, they will wise up and they will come to the end of the Trump era. Let them go and then start anew with, with fresh people, fresh Republicans, fresh everything. You know, because he, he, what, what Trump did, he drew out all the other cheaters. You're right. You know? Yeah, he he identified the swamp animals. Like, you know how he used to say, clean the, clean the swamp? Well, now we know who to clean. You yeah. know, Ted Cruz, uh, uh, all those guys, all those idiots, you know, Matt Gates, uh, Jim Jordan, Marjorie Taylor, whatever her name is. McCarthy, the whole crew. All those guys. And yeah. all they're doing is just lying and making a fool of themselves in front of people. Their, their word means nothing anymore. And I love the way the news, what the news do. They, they show Trump's face, but they don't, you don't hear his words. Because those words are toxic. People will hear them and, and will think, well, I guess that's what it is, you know. Because he's, he's like a hypnotic guy. But I credit Trump with having Biden elected. Biden would never have gotten near the White House had it not been for Trump. And so when Trump wants to run again, it's like, okay. He doesn't want to get off the spit. You know, they, they're, they're roasting him. <laughs> he's yeah. on there. He'll take down the Republican Party. I always thought that he would be impeached, and then they would bring uh, Mitt Romney mm -hmm. to the fore. I, I think Mitt, Mitt, you know, he, he's got the wherewithal, you know, to lead, probably. But now I, I look at the Republicans, I don't see anybody there. There is no Biden without 
a Trump and probably there is no Trump without an Obama. And there is no Trump without enablers at NBC that gave him a network show for 10 years so he could become a celebrity. They taught him how to act. Yeah. And and that's the only thing he knows how to do. That's why he wants to do those rallies all the time, because he loves that attention and love and everything else, you know. As a comedian, you can relate because yeah. there's nothing like stage time. You, it is the coin of the realm from yeah. the smallest opening act, to the biggest celebrity. And yeah. you know, it is like a frigging, I don't have to tell you, <laughs> you know better than anybody, but it is like a frigging shot in yep. the forearm. And it is the most powerful drug that I have ever partaken. Is and you will you will wait months for your five minutes yeah. at the comedy club. You don't even know the name of it, but you you you'll sit in the wait outside until it's your turn to get on for that five minutes, just to have that that attention on you. So so we know what what Trump's suffering from, you know. Yeah, and, 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 and I, he needs that. He needs that. I, I can say that I suffered from it myself. I did not get the huge hits that that some of my celebrity friends have had, but I still understand the power of it. And it's, the, like I said, the most powerful drug that, I, that I've ever had a sniff of. I, I don't know if it happened to you, but I remember when when I started playing music, I was always a backup guitar player. And, and so... Uh, the singers would get the job first, then they would call me and then would say, you know, I need you to come in. And it wasn't until we put a band together, and I say we, I never put a band together. I was never that good of a musician to, to lead anything. But when I got the band together, then I started playing with the mic a little bit. First of all, I'd be introducing, uh, okay, the first thing I did on stage was, uh, okay, this is uh, the last song tonight. Thanks for coming. Want everybody to, you know, thank you for coming. And uh, and if you're driving, be careful, you know, on your way home. I'd say that in the mic. I look forward to that every night, that, that little bit of mic time. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then since I was a kid, I used to work on my voice, not consciously, but kind of subconsciously, because I grew up with radio. I was always listening to the radio. We never had television, and we never got television until I was 12, 13 years old. My earliest time was radio. Oh, man, and I would be glued to the radio. And so that's how we did our records, because Lou Adler saw the act. He says, uh, well, how can I help you guys? I said, well, we want to make a comedy record. It was the first time Cheech heard me say that. <laughs> he said, oh, really? And he looked at me. <laughs> I remember that look, you know. We do. <laughs> <laughs> And our comedy records were right from the very first bit to the very last bit. We were something special. Oh, yeah. And that's the way it's always been. You know, the question is for everybody, why am I doing this? You know, why? Why am I doing this? Especially actors, you know, you know, they get turned down a zillion times and, and they ask themselves, why am I doing this? Is for that little sliver of recognition, and they're going to say, oh, you were great, blah, blah, blah. The power of the stage, I guess it is. Yeah, it's so powerful. And I, I believe that the PVP is what I call him, Putin's vice president or the billionaire brat boy. It, it doesn't even matter if he wins. It's just the stage time. There's two years of stage time out there if I run for president. It's two years. I'm booked. <laughs> I'm booked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, what will what'll happen to Trump when the political thing is through with him, you know, well, well it's up to him when he decides, you know, you know, <laughs> I really need help. <laughs> you know, one day, one day he, he, he will say, you know, I can't do this alone anymore. I need help. I need a, I need my mommy. I need my my uh, whatever it is. He'll, he'll be welcoming jail. Let's, let's put it that way. Well, do you think, He's going to go to jail. You you, know, people so the say, indictments are coming. The indictments are indeed coming. They can't help it. People were killed. People died. He tried to overthrow a fucking government. The only really strong democracy in the world. And he, he he's tinkering with it, you know? Right. Yeah. For, for, for racist reasons, you know? There's a, a, a show, I, I guess, on Prime about Lincoln uh-huh. and, and during the war. You, you know why they won the war or one of the reasons? 
I will give you my reason is because after the Emancipation Proclamation, the blacks left the plantations en masse while there were anti-draft riots in New York. Recently, freed blacks were filling the ranks of the Union Army, vacating the plantation, and the balance of power shifted and it never returned. But you know why they won, though? Tell me. The reason, you know, the reason they won is that Lincoln had access to this new fangled uh, uh, way of communication called the telegraph. Mm -hmm. And so he was in constant connection with his generals all through the war. He, he knew where they were, what they were doing, and so on, as opposed to everybody else. They had to use the old-fashioned way of, uh, you know, writers telling them what, Very you know. Nice. But uh, Lincoln had the telegraph. And it wasn't until Gettysburg that the rebels uh, cut the lines. And so he, he, he couldn't communicate with, with Gettysburg. But thankfully, you know, the, gen the people that they had, they had the overwhelming uh, superior power. And they had a chance to really destroy the Confederate army because after the, when they attacked at Gettysburg, they're, they're going for Philly, but that's as far as they got. And when they got beat, they had to turn around and the river stopped them. And so the rebels were trapped. They were, you know, a defeated army trapped, but the, the, the Union army was just as messed up as the rebels, and they didn't want to fight either. They didn't want to go after the and, and kill the, uh, the 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 rebels. So uh, Lee uh, got away. You know, they 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 got across the river and they got away. And then Sherman uh, did the scorched earth policy, and that really stopped it. You know, when Sherman took over and uh, oh, Grant yeah. came east, and yeah. Grant had a different idea about warfare, and that is. We will grind them to bits because we have more men, more steel, more bullets, more cannons. We yeah. will. This is the math. We will grind them, and it took two more years, and he did. That's what happened. And and Sheridan was was the one too that came up with this, uh, the, putting the natives on the uh, on the reservations and then killing the buffalo, so they would have no food supply. And well, that's Sheridan. what he. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what he did with uh, Lee's army. In that he would, they when they marched to Savannah, they mm -hmm. they, they destroyed all the uh, the farms and everything else on the way. It was, it was like scorched earth, right. and then they created all these like like just like Putin was trying to do in in the Ukraine, you know, mm -hmm. scorched earth. But unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, where the rebels never had the artillery that. That, uh, that Ukrainians uh, now do. The Ukrainians, you know, they got all this new weaponry that we don't even know about, that, what they he, got. To me, everything reflects back from the Civil War. That is the founding moment of our nation, including the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, abolishing slavery, uh, equal um, protection under the law. You know, all these things really start during and then after the Civil War. But now in the moment we're in, Trump... I feel has been defeated, but he hasn't admitted it. Putin has been defeated. He has not admitted it. The guy down in Brazil has been defeated. Is this a watershed moment maybe of, you know, maybe more of a democratic moment prevailing over authoritarianism? Do you have no, that? we're watching a slow death. Those people are hard to kill. You know, they die slowly. You know, it's not, you know, they're not going to get enlightened overnight. You know, they they have to be destroyed. I mean that that's a civil war. You know, would have kept going if it wasn't for that Gettysburg, which everybody saw and says, you know, this is a slaughter. You know, at this rate, there's not going to be a no one here. You know, no young men to 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 work the land or anything. Uh, you know what's saving us, by the way, it's the cell phone. Yeah, that's it. That's it. now the bad news is that the cell phone will show you a lie. The good news is that that lie will be exposed. And eventually, you know, it's like math. You know, you get a wrong answer up there. No matter how long that answer is up there, it's still wrong. And so when you correct it, it's a very simple thing. you got to look at people, too, like, like a rehab. You know, the, the, there's an addiction going on with war 
like Russia, for instance, uh, their only valuable asset is the oil. And so when the oil prices started dropping before the war, uh, they knew that the only way that they could keep the oil prices up was to start a war. And that's why he started the war. And Putin is like Trump. He's unbalanced. But again, it's the fate of the whole planet is in balance, you know, and, and this is how we're coping with it. They call them better angels. Well, the better angels, in order to route out, you know, the, the corruption and the greed and the, and the fear is, is to let it play out, you know, like Trump. You know, I, I saw where he could have been down as the greatest president ever. But he, he missed his opportunity because he lied. Like I said about golf, he broke the rules, you see. Don't call yourself a builder unless you are a builder. You know, just because you can afford to have people build things for you don't, doesn't call you, doesn't make you a builder, you see. And Trump had everybody fooled thinking that, oh, he, he built this stuff. He knows how to tear stuff down. He knows how to rebuild it. And so I'm thinking, if this guy is smart, he will get a piece of the infrastructure and be richer than anybody on the planet. Right. And, and it would have ensured his legacy into yeah. the future and a reelection. It would it, it was there for him, but he did not have the capacity to do that. Yeah, you know what his weakness is? <laughs> Tell me. His dick. <laughs> yeah. His penis. Yeah. <laughs> he just got him in more trouble. Just like all those guys, like Weinstein and Cosby and all those guys. They had no control over their penis. And we're built with control. Yeah. I mean, you know, the first thing we learn how to do is disarm that little sucker. You yeah. know. And 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 if you do it enough times at the right moment, then you're you're gonna escape a lot of the bad bad times in jail. <laughs> because you gotta control that sucker. You got Do you have any over. memories of Cosby? I've known Bill. I did a, a little bit of a show for them one time when everything was transitioning. He wasn't uh, in the Cosby show anymore, and he was looking for something. My daughter worked for him, Robbie. She, uh, you bet your life. And and she finally, she, she was really good friends with the daughters and that. So she had never had anything bad to say about Bill still. But she did admit that he come on to her. When you know, because that's why he hired her because she's gorgeous and uh, and young, and and he hit on her, but but she never had that. You know, she's my daughter, so she never had that need to uh, you know to see her name in lights or anything like that. And and every everything is it's a learning thing. You know, what, what I was going to say about oil that was the basis of the Second World War. Uh, with Japan. Japan, what happened with Japan, they, they trained. And so they had all this killing power, but they had no one to kill. And so they had to go looking for people to to conquer, to kill, to murder, you know, because they learned all that, that stuff. That's the dangerous part about war, is you teach people how to kill. Now, how do you teach them how not to kill? You can't. And so you get a whole generation of, uh, well, gun nuts like we have uh, right here, you know. In America. Now. Yeah, yeah. You know, you mentioned the Civil War, and I always read and think about it. And I always feel like the catastrophic level of violence that those people, the survivors experienced, the traumatic effect of that and the fetish over guns, I feel like it. And then the Wild West with the gunfights and everybody with a gun on their hip. I don't think you can separate that kind of madness from the violence that was the Civil War. I mean, when you think about Gettysburg, 30, 40, 50,000, you know, within three days. I mean, this is unimaginable in human history. And somehow the psychic cost of that violence, for better or worse, we don't really account for it in the American story. But I think it's at the core of it. You know, we have not given that up. Well, you can't. I'll, I'll tell you why. It's hard to, to see and to realize the depth of that. And the reason is very simple. The reason is, is that us humans, we're eternal beings. See, we're only here on in the physical world to learn. And what we have to learn, you learn how to walk, you learn how to talk, you learn how to eat, you learn how to do things. You had to learn this. And it takes years to evolve to that, 
to the part where you can have a, a, a cognitive, you know, a, a decent thought in your head, where you can realize what's going on, or or you can question why we're here. But the truth is, we're here to learn. And violence, if if you're talking eternal, which I am, we are our eternal beings. Therefore, it doesn't matter how you die. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's another transition. You know, it doesn't matter if you're shot, murdered, lynched, uh, accidental, heart attack, doesn't matter. Because it's it's a moment that's going to happen to everybody. Because our spirit is eternal. You know, you know our spirit. You're, you, the spirit that, that, that propels you has always been here. Bill, you're, eternal, you're an eternal being. Your I spirit. I, I wish I could embrace that. I would be more patient with my career. Hey, I'm eternal. I don't. I, I don't That's even... right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, what you're doing is what you're supposed to be doing. See? You're doing. This is what I this is what I come up with. Just think of this now. The, the reason there's so many wars on the planet is because peace is so boring. You don't learn nothing from peace. What do you learn? You know what happens? If you don't have big problems, your little problems become big problems. So you see wealthy people, they don't have any problems, but yes, they do. Because they've taken their little problems, which is maybe a, a, a mental problem or a, a, an emotional problem, and all of a sudden that's the biggest thing in the world. Well, you take a little bigger kid from India, you know, that that was deformed purposely so he can make more money. He's got a whole different outlook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's got a whole different set of problems that he has to worry about. You know what I'm saying? And so your big problems, and so what it is, because we are eternal beings, we are learning, always in a conscious state of learning. And the one rule, love thy neighbor, love thy neighbor, love who you and your neighbor is the tree, the grass, the water, the air, the, the, the neighbor next door to you, or the nutcase that's... Uh, driving too fast in the neighborhood. We're all neighbors. We're all neighbors. And the best way to get along with your neighbors is to love them. Love them. Take care of them. Watch out for them. You know, understand what their their problems are. And, and if you can help, help. When you do that, then birds of a feather flock together. You attract other people like that. Just like, just like a, a guy, say, attracting a, a partner. There has to be a need first. That need has to be filled. The, a friend of mine, uh, he was Chicano. Uh, uh, he was Lenny Bruce's road manager for a long time. Oh, wow. And he was, he was the guy that used to buy dope for Lenny, and, and he ultimately bought the, the one that killed him. Tony Vizcarra was his name. And his, his niece, his sister's daughter, Evelyn Guerrero, she was in all our movies. You know, she was uh, La Donna. In, in all the movies. Well, Tony's father was a very hip guy from Mexico. And uh, you know how he'd find a wife? He would interview maids. <laughs> he'd interview housekeepers. He would hire them. And then if there was anything there, he would marry them. You know, if there's something there, it's a, a fine system. We, as a, as a, a species on this planet, our job really is to further the love. Didn't Jesus have something about that? Love thy neighbor, mm -hmm. the servant on the mount, the whole thing. Jesus, that wasn't Jesus. Jesus wasn't his name, by the way. What was his name? I, I get it. <laughs> probably Joe. Joe, okay. Was probably after his father. Yeah, okay. But I know his middle name was just H. Jesus H, but <laughs> <laughs> I know whenever it was it Howard or Hugh, what well, H, you know, like I didn't ever but check it out. No, Jesus was his name given him to by the Greeks. Aha, and, right. it, and it means savior, savior, Jesus. So his name wasn't Jesus, his name was probably Joseph Jr., and he wasn't that big, he was a, a slightly built Jewish guy. Right, right. That, that and they called him a carpenter, but he was a probably a, a laborer, a builder. Because back in the day, a carpenter 
You build mud huts and stone huts. Yeah, so, maybe a stonemason or something. A mason. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah, that's what it, that's what it would be. But carpenter, you know, gives you an idea. No, he's a laborer. He was a laborer, and he was a very devout Jew that really believed in the temple. He believed in the Word of God. You know, it was the Jews that discovered the invisible world. They were the first to worship a, a spiritual God. Which meant casting off idolatry, essentially. Yes, 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 yes. And, and I'm, I, you know, when I was in Greece, I, I was looking at all these ruins and that, and there's so many ruins over in that area where they it went from, uh, it was a, a, a mosque, and then it got conquered, it became a Catholic church, right. and then it got conquered again, then it became a synagogue, right. and, and then it got conquered again. Now it's back being a, a mosque again, depending on who's in power. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's the same building. It's the same building. <laughs> yeah, it's the same building. And so religion was created in order to give people a path forward with their life. And that's why the great prophets have shown up at different times. The first real religious, spiritual, organized spirituality, I think, was in India. Buddha. I think India started it all, because their Baba Gita goes back 25,000 years, something like that. Yeah. You know, that's their holy book. And so, yeah. and, and there was no writing anywhere. Everything was uh, a vocal. Oral traditions. Oral tradition, yeah. Right. And so, so you, can, you can see how the Bible has been uh, uh, embellished by all the writers, you know, the, the good, very good writers, you know. I mean, who else would come up with, uh, you know, the seas parting, <laughs> you know, and the God stopping the sun? <laughs> we, need a, we need a rewrite. Can we, who can you get? We need a rewrite. The, 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 <laughs> how the Jews get across the sea? We need a rewrite. Somebody <laughs> think of something and they bring in the sky. Well, the, the seas, they parted. Well, how do I... Did you ever hear Lenny Bruce's bit about Moses? Was it in the movie Lenny? I don't think so. No, I, no. Used, I, I remember think, reading his book. I think or, it was in his book. I think it was in his uh, book. But it was, well, well, Moses, you know, was a very fictional uh, character in some ways, but he was raised by the, by the royal courts. In see. Egypt, right. Yeah, in Egypt. He was dealing with a lot of writers because that's what he learned. He learned how to read and write. Right. The Egyptian way. And so, so and, and write books. And if you go back, there's all sorts of writings about the so-called prophets. None of the prophets really knew Jesus, or none of the writers of the Bible knew Jesus. Jesus. You know, he was gone long before that. It was all myth, all myth. But it's it's the truth. When the Christians, what they believe is that he was in three days, he would rise again. He would become again. Well, the non-spiritual people, they couldn't get it in their head. What happens when you die? You don't disappear. You, you, you're now you're in the spiritual world, and so and you can come back, but you don't come back necessarily as a, as a, another human being. You've gone through that already. You you're evolved to the point where you can come in spiritual form as an angel or as a uh, you know as a as a word. Well, that's my... maybe why so many Aboriginal cultures, you, you know. The spirit world to them is not something in the abstract. It's real. No. It's not just fake. It, you know. No. As a matter of fact, like I mentioned to you earlier, I was in on these dinosaur digs in South Dakota. Now these dinosaurs or these bones or fossils like this, yeah. they were self-evident to the Indian people who had been hunting and living in these areas for millennia. Yeah. They didn't just appear when white paleontologists showed up, but they had a very different attitude about them, which is don't mess with them. They are part of this other spiritual dimension. And it wasn't something you know, like you know, hocus pocus. It was real. It was real. It wasn't anything that was deemed imaginary. And I, no. I was just struck by what you said in terms of making me think about just some of my recent experiences. And, yeah. And I will just add to that. When Hamlet, for example, people say, how do you play Hamlet? You know, he sees this ghost, it's his father, and the ghost is speaking to him out of another dimension. Well, guess what? That other dimension is real and it's vivid as the 
this table and the dimension that we're living in. And at certain moments, these two worlds intersect and we get a glimpse into them. Sure, because we're in physical form now and, and we can rejoice and be glad because uh, being in, in, in a physical form, we, we can taste the fruits of the labors and everything. And we can feel, we can feel the emotions and everything. And we have a choice. Biggest thing that that you learn, at least I learned, is is the choices that we have. Uh, we, we can choose to do anything. I, I'm watching my little, uh, she's two and a half now, my little granddaughter grow up. And, and I'm just, I just love her so much because she's showing me you know, as she learns, as she evolves, and and that little mind, is, oh my God, it's so beautiful. It just operates on such a been here forever kind of feeling. You know, it's not my first rodeo. There's such a joy. And now I do cameos, Bill. And I, I tell people, you know, because I'm getting older, you know, and, and a lot of times I get, you know, you get cameos where they say uh, he needs a pep talk. He's, you know, he's feeling neglected or whatever and, and and i tell people now i says enjoy your weaknesses you know enjoy being ignored i'm reveling in my anonymity it's yes. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it you come to christmas <laughs> you know why because you have your music yeah see your music is your connection to the spirit it is see that's my connection that's my connection. Every once in a while, I'll be watching TV, and all of a sudden, I'll just reach over, pick up the guitar, turn off the TV, turn on the guitar, and I'll start seeing where my fingers go. <laughs> you know you know what I've been playing lately is the, the, the national anthem. Not an easy song. No, but so much fun if you, if you play with it and, and make it beautiful. It is one of the most beautiful songs ever written. Uh, with the lyrics yeah and then then i started playing the canadian uh national anthem oh which for for years was horrible oh we used to sing it in, oh canada uh -huh. our home and native land true patriot love from all our sons command with glowing hearts we see thee rise there true nor strong and free and we stand on guard, oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Da, 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 da. Oh Canada, mm -hmm. glorious and free, oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Da, 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 da. Oh Canada, we stand on guard. Mm -hmm. Now you stand on guard, but you don't do any fighting. What the fuck is that? Mm -hmm. Our um, national anthem is a is a, is a war story from the Battle Everybody, of eighteen twelve. It's, it's, it's celebrating war. Yeah, Eight, rockets red glare. Our flag was still there. Bombs bursting in air. Yeah. You know, it's like so. And, which is interesting because may I, when you were singing a song, it made me wonder what the differences between the the United States experience of multiculturalism, racism. You know, they're the way we dealt, dealt with Aboriginal people, Pacific Rim people like your, some of your ancestors versus the Canadian experience. My feeling is the Canadian experience is, is gentler and less drenched in violence. Experience. Oh, it is. It is. The United States and Canada took so much from the Native culture, from the Aboriginal culture here. You know, our Senate is from the Senecas, the Council. That was, you know, all that was figured out by the natives down here. The early Americans, the first Americans, was never meant to be segregated, thanks to the English that <laughs> pulled that stuff up. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that it wasn't quite the same catastrophe for Aboriginal people within the Canadian borders as it was within the U.S. borders. I had a, a, a strong epiphany. Why were the Jews persecuted? And then I realized, same as Mao, what, the, what Mao did to the Chinese intellectuals, the Jews were persecuted because they were the intellectuals of the species. They had evolved to the point 
where the last resort would be physical violence, not the first. The first would be discussion. The first would be, let's talk about this. And let's, let's even give this to the wise men. Let's, let's have them do it. It's a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion, a lot of discussion. The last thing you do w- was to do anything uh, uh, physical. And that's, that's their way. The warmongers, they saw that as a sign of weakness, you know, like collecting art. Why is that so important, you know? And then the smart ones like Hitler and Goebbels and that, you know, they knew, you know, it was all about wealth and, and that was an excuse to rob the intellectuals because they were equipped to do war. It's just picking on the weakest. But then you see the evolution of the intellectual because the intellectual is living in this violent world. But if you look at life as eternal, all this makes sense. Other than that, you know, you, you, get, you can get caught in certain time warps, you know. Mm-hmm. And, but we don't. We've had our music. As long as you've got a musical instrument, that's, that's your connection to God, you know. Like the art of tuning up an instrument, that is one of the most spiritual endeavors on the planet. Because it's God. That, that's God speaking to us. Yeah, and if, you know, with the clarinet, this is the instrument, but this is also the instrument because this yeah. doesn't, it needs breath, it needs yeah. airflow, and it, it doesn't does. exist, it, it's, it's meaningless without it. Unless there's breath, it doesn't yeah. work. So we're as much of the, the instrument as the actual instrument, so. For sure. And Same as a guitar, a guitar is just a piece of wood and some metal. Yeah, and strings. So you know what the first guitar was, and the uh, talking about slaves. Uh huh. You Tell know, me. you know the singer Bo Diddley. Of course. You know what a Bo Diddley is? It's no. a piece of haywire strung across the side of a barn with a bridge in it to make it taunt. Uh huh. And you hit it like a drum. Do 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 do. That's a Bo Diddley. And he took that name. And he took it. As his own name. I've been doing some research on uh, rhythm and blues. Did you know Elvis' first song was about a woman talking about her lover? Ma, what's her name? Anyway, she wrote Hound Dog. Listen to the lyrics. You ain't nothing but a hound dog sniffing all around. You ain't never caught a rabbit. You ain't no friend of mine. You said you was high class. Well, that was just a lie. Uh, I forget the rest of it. But anyway, it's about a woman telling a guy, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. Elvis took it, and, and they put a little dog beside me singing, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. He's singing to a dog. <laughs> it, it shows you how fucking lame white people were. Oh, man. And they did that with all the songs. Elvis's first uh, album was all black songs, you know. Oh, yeah, there's no be- Elvis without the black rhythm and blues artists that preceded nope. him. There's no. no Elvis. Jerry Lee Lewis or any of those guys. No. Jerry Lee Lewis was the Little Richard. It's all about appropriation, but it's also oh. about cross-cultural fertilization. And, uh, you know, I because I live in jazz, you know, and, of yeah. course, jazz lives and sits on the blues. Yeah. And the rhythm of Africa, no question, is it's without it's so fundamental. But jazz, as we know it, also you know is saxophones and European instruments and Jewish composers like uh, you know Irving Berlin and Hoagy Carmichael who wasn't Jewish. But so ultimately, it becomes a bigger and more beautiful synthesis. And even like uh, Django, you know, the French Euro Gypsy influence, it just it's like. Come on in and join, because guess what? We're all human, baby. It's one big yeah. family. Yeah. You know, Cheech, he, he got uh, his own art museum called the Cheech, you know? Well, I'm going to have my own art museum, too. I'm going to call it the Chong. But it's, <laughs> going, to, it's going to be uh, a, a stoner museum, stoner art. Interesting. But the main thing will be a jazz club. Because that's where I, I came from. I came from a jazz club. I came out of a jazz club. My, I, when I first started smoking pot, was in a jazz club. That's what my, my office or my, my favorite place will be, it will be the jazz club, with a jukebox. I'm going to have a jukebox 
and the people can use the jukebox and pick out the songs that they want to play. You see, they they took that away from us. Know. You know, there was a time when you go to a club, when the band stopped or the show stopped, they would turn on the jukebox, and then you could walk over with a handful of quarters and pick up your songs. And play the same one over and over again if you want it, which I used to do, and that was my early time. Now I, I tried to put this in a in a couple of movies, and that it never worked. <laughs> All right, bro. Well, I want to thank you for the time and uh, meditations on our current moment. It's always wonderful, man. Bill, let's do this always. All right, we'll make it. We'll just make it our. It's a series, man. It's okay. a series. All right, bro. I'll- take care. I'll see you soon. I'll be back. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, man. Bye.